Good afternoon, Oak Grove. Glad to be back here again with you today. We are going to be looking at um, the Gospel Project and talking about John when he made that statement and that he must increase, but I must, I, I'm sorry, that he must increase, that I must decrease. And that's what we'll be talking about today, about preparing the way for Jesus. Um, and that's what John did. That's what his um, job here on earth was at that time. And we know a, a few things about John, about what, what he ate, what he wore. And he was a straightforward type guy. He would not um, be, be around the bush. He would say it like it is. And if we look at Isaiah uh, chapter 40, verse 3, it says, a, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And that's what John did. And that was written in Isaiah many, many years before this. But John, who was born shortly uh, before Jesus, they were close in age, they were cousins. And um, John's, like I said, John's job here was to prepare the way for Jesus. And that's what he did. And the scripture tells us as we get into it that he did not know um, Jesus until he saw him, until he came out in that water and he baptized him. Then he realized that he was the Messiah. I guess they didn't have too many cousin uh, sleepovers when they were kids. No, yeah. must not have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or, you know, like I said, John was out in the desert and wilderness and eating the bugs and, you know, doing all the things that he did out there. And so he probably wasn't the most um, pleasant person to be around. Social, yeah. social butterfly. Yeah. Talk about social um, distance. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they kept it back then. But um, before we get into that, just re remind you, um, you know, once the evenings at 630, we meet online for prayer. So please, um, if you need to find out how to do that, just um, give us a call and we'll plan to tell you how to do that. And we we're always, always open to any prayer requests. You can call the office or call us individually. If you have a prayer request or a need, please um, don't forget we are here for you. And we would love to hear from you. Pick in the number, Richard. Sir? The number? Um, you know, the call of the church office, you can call 410-838-9898. And um, in the, I believe in the Grove News a few weeks ago, we had our numbers in there, individually, mm -hmm. um, numbers, for certain days of the week. But that was just so we, we didn't know how many calls we would get. So please, um do that. Call us. Let us know what's going on in your lives and what you need, um, what, how we can pray for you. And please continue to pray for us. And just to remind you, Sunday mornings, we're still here at um, 10 o'clock in the morning for our Sunday morning service out in the park a lot. And we've been talking about, you know, if there's a way to improve that. And we're still discussing that. But stay tuned. But please come out. Um, tune in your radio. And come join the other members of Oak Grove Baptist Church. I'm glad to see you. So with that, I'd like to open us up in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. Dear Lord, we thank you for all your blessings. Dear Lord, we thank you that you promise you will always be with us. So we know you're here. We know that you know what's going on um, locally and throughout the world today with this virus. Dear Lord, we pray for healing of our land. We pray more and more people will pray for it. Pray more and more people will come to you and open their hearts to you and realize they need you in their lives. Dear Lord, I pray as uh, we always do for our uh, workers in the hospital, doctors, nurses, and techs, and everyone involved. Um, dear Lord, I pray for their safety. Please protect them. We pray for the families of those that um, are dealing or have dealt with this virus. We pray for those families uh, that know someone has died. Please give them comfort. Dear Lord, we know that you can get us through this as you always have. So be with us, be with um, our uh, political leaders and decisions they make, dear Lord, and the guidance they give. And just pray that people be safe, keep their distance, um, keep that mask going when they're out. And dear Lord, just help us through this. And we look forward to that day when we can meet again as a church. But more than that, we look forward to that day when we see you face to face. So be with us now, dear Lord. Just bless each person here. Bless everybody listening, and dear Lord, to you be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> so.
Somebody like to read the first <clears throat> set of verses? I will. Right, starting in John uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 29. The next day he, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Mm. Amen. So this is John's eyewitness account. Uh, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, and I know I've heard people time and time again repeat this verse erroneously. Uh, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, why do you think that John said the singular rather than the plural? I think he's talking about sin as a whole. When you, when you think about sins, you think about uh, plural sins, you know, this guy sinned, that guy sinned, uh, she sinned, and this is what they did. But when you talk about sin in general, I think that's what he was trying to get at by not saying sins, plural, sin as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus came to take away. And to specify sin of the world, because remember, Jesus never sinned. So he had no sin. So his sins, because there were not any, any sins, did not have to be forgiven. So it's a sin of the world and not of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I believe, from what I've read and from what I've studied, that I, I believe that John is speaking of Adam, not you, Adam, <laughs> uh, the first Adam. Uh, his original sin was disobedient, being disobedient to God. He disobeyed God, and that started a domino effect uh, where the consequences are still felt today. So I believe that what John is saying is, here is the one who has come to undo that which was done in the Garden of Eden. Uh, that's just my opinion. Um, Paul says in Romans 5.12, Therefore just a sin, singular, came into the world through one man, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law yet. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Mm -hmm. uh, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one's, one man's trespass, again singular, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounding for many. Mm -hmm. That's just my extrapolation of that. It's interesting. That, mm -hmm. uh, because Paul is talking singular sin mm -hmm. uh, in, in that sense. And I believe that that ties to what John the Baptist is saying. Mm -hmm. Because one sin leads to another sin. I like what it says here. Um, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me, even though John was a little a few months older yeah, six than, months than older. Jesus. Yeah. Um, but he knew that Jesus was on this earth and here and always was Eternal. long before John. <laughs> right. There's a little theology in what John's doing here. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, the, the eternality of, of uh, Jesus, the, the sonship of Jesus, which is really the deity of Jesus. So he's telling us here that Jesus is God, because when you are the son of God, you are God 
himself. Well, here, as he opened up and starting verse 29, I mean, the people uh, John were preaching to were very familiar uh, with the role that sheep played in the temporary atonement for their sin uh, because of uh, because the punishment for sin is death. So each family unit was required to offer sacrifices then uh, to atone uh, for their sin. But each uh, payment was temporary, and the sacrifice was made over and over and over again, you know, prior to Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of, when, when John announced that Jesus is the Lamb of God, then this uh, language would have been both familiar and strange, probably, to the people as well. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, they were probably thinking, you know, how could a man take the role of a sac sacrificial lamb, um, and how could he take away the sins of the world? It's just kind of parallel thinking. Right. And if, and if you turn the page here of the study that, or the scripture we're reading and go over to, to chapter 2, verse 13, we see it's the Passover. So they're preparing for the Passover, which obviously is, I say obvious, if you go back to uh, Exodus 12, uh, we read of the, the Israelites being held captive in Egypt and Moses going to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. You know, we think of Charlton Heston. <laughs> When we, when we think of that, and, and after all the plagues came about, finally it was the firstborn son is going to die unless you slaughter a lamb and put its blood on the doorpost and lentils. And if you do that, then the angel of death will pass over you. And so every year the, the Jews celebrated Passover uh, mm -hmm. as a remembrance of God's deliverance. Mm -hmm. And so it was that lamb that, that was slain that help them stay alive. Right. It led them to life. Um, and, and every family that came to Jerusalem for Passover had to kill a lamb. Um, but that those weren't the only lambs that were killed. Um, every day, two lambs were killed in that temple, one in the morning and one in the evening uh, for the forgiveness of sins. Um, and as we look at John and think about you know Elizabeth and Zacharias, his mother and father, his dad was a temple priest. Um, my dad was a cop. My dad came home every day with a you know firearm and a badge, and I would hear him and mom talk about you know the perp he collared that day and you know what who he pulled over and, and that sort of thing. And I'm sure that when Zachariah came home, he probably told Elizabeth, "Hey, Elizabeth, you wouldn't believe what happened in the temple today." <laughs> um, you know, he probably had blood all over him right? mm -hmm. because if if you've ever slaughtered an animal, and and I have in my life, um, cows and pigs and, and all that kind of thing, a uh, deer. Um, it's bloody it's, job. Yeah, you don't wear your best clothes to do it because you're going to get something on you. Yeah. Um, and so Zechariah probably came home covered in blood, and John saw this imagery all his life. And he probably, when he saw Jesus, he thought, wow, the blood that's in that man's veins is the actual blood of God. And when it is shed, it is going to wash away all of our sins. Uh, that had to be overwhelming for John sure. to see that. Mm. Incredible. In the book, it makes a statement, not only does the Lamb of God take away the penalty of our sin, but he also removes its power. Mm -hmm. So nobody else can do that. And no animal can do that. That's right. um, only Jesus can do that. That is exactly right. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that sounded almost like my, my Easter sermon. That God removes the... What Jesus did removes the, the penalty of our sin, removes the power of sin in our lives, and will eventually remove the presence of sin from our lives, mm -hmm. uh, according to Romans 8. Um, uh, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Mm. Amen. Well, why do you think that lambs had to be slain every day? If somebody asks you that, you know, what, why is Christianity such a bloody religion? Because that, that's, has, that has been a, a moniker that the Christian faith has suffered with uh, for, you know, two millennia. Mm -hmm. why, is, why is Christianity such a bloody faith? Why do we talk about blood all the time? Why did, why did lambs have to be sacrificed? And in, in, in order for you know, God to be, his anger to be assuaged. Mm -hmm. well, um, it was sort of like John the Baptist. It was prepared people for the blood of Jesus, that one day Jesus would shed on that cross. Right. So it, it helped to prepare 
as time went on, from from Adam on on um, to the New Testament, that people saw this blood being spilled, and they didn't. I don't think they understood it, what it was going to mean mm -hmm. or what it meant at the time. Um, but then it prepared, just like like I said, John the Baptist prepared them for Jesus' blood to be shed on the cross. Mm -hmm. Right. It was all about Jesus. Yeah. That, everything in the Bible points to him. Uh, Hebrews 9, uh, 18 and on. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God sprinkled for you. And in the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is why Jesus came. He came to be our sacrifice. He came to be that uh, atonement. That atonement, amen. That's right. Substitutional atonement. That, and that was the next point that I had. He yeah. was a sacrifice, and he was a substitution. Dying in our place. Mm -hmm. Amen. Usually when somebody uh, sinned, they brought the, the lamb to be sacrificed. Uh, so the sinner brought the sacrifice. Uh, in this case, God provided the sacrifice, uh, much like uh, Genesis 22 on, on Mount Moriah, when Abraham takes Isaac up. Um, you know, Isaac, uh, commentators believe, could have been a, a teenager, 16, 17, certainly old enough to overcome a 100-year-old man, a uh, 100-plus-year-old man. And he's like, hey, Father, you've got the knife, and you've got the wood, and you've got the flame. Um, where's the sacrifice? Where's the sacrifice? Oh, don't worry about it, son. We'll take it. God's going to provide. And little did Abraham know that as he ascended one side of Mount Moriah, that ram was ascending the other side. And, and sometimes in our lives, particularly now, when we can't see what's going on on the other side of the mountain, we don't know what blessing God has in store for us. Wow. All we have to keep doing is pressing forward like Abraham did in faith, trusting God. And by the time he got up there, all of a sudden, hey, there's a ram with its horns caught in the thicket. Ah, oh, there's our sacrifice. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. Amen. I don't know. Are we just next set of verses? Sure. Uh, this is actually from John chapter 3, starting in verse 25. Now a discussion arose between some of John's <laughs> disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing. And all are going to him. But John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Mm. That's, that's one of the greatest verses in the greatest book in the world. Agreed. And if you just go down a couple paragraphs in our book, it says, True worship of Jesus prompts us to promote Jesus, not ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful with that, that we aren't um, making people think that we're great or anything right. special about us. Right. It's all about Jesus. Amen. And um, once the focus is yeah. taken off of him and placed on us, we fall down. And it sends the world the wrong message. Yeah, of course it does. Well, the, the world likes celebrity. If the world did not like celebrity, the National Enquirer, Entertainment Tonight, all these tabloid, TMZ, they wouldn't exist. People love celebrity, and I don't. I I don't know why. I guess it's because we're a fallen race, but I, I don't know what the attraction is to it. Um, 
But uh, John did not want to be a celebrity. He had the opportunity. These people came to him, and instead of saying, I'm the man, he said, there's the man. There's the lamb. There's God himself. And John showed tremendous humility um, in doing that because it would have been very... Uh, last week when we did our study, we, we, we studied uh, Satan trying to tempt Jesus. And, you know, he told Jesus, hey, jump off the highest point of the temple and, uh, you know, and, and Psalm 91 will be fulfilled. You know, he, he will not let his, his angels won't let your feet touch the rocks. And Jesus could have been a great celebrity doing that even before his ministry started. You know, he could have had a stadium with 30,000 people a week. Um, you know, he could have had books on the best sellers list, but that's not why he came. It wasn't his focus. Um, and, and so Jesus, you know, of course, rebuked Satan with God's word. And uh, it, when I went to Liberty University, uh, one of the classes that I took in seminary was called Preventing Ministry Failure. And I, I love that class because it, uh, uh, it, it took some of the, the things that historically have burned pastors out and have caused, uh, you know, the, the old statistic is there's like 1,500 ministers leave the ministry every month. Uh, that's pathetic. Uh, and it's sad. Um, but it's easy to get burned out when you're trying to be all things to all people. Uh, and I'm not saying that's what every person that, you know, leaves ministry is done. Uh, it's just a symptom uh, of a bigger sickness. Uh, but one of the things I learned in that class is that the number one problem in ministry among staffs is jealousy. Mm. You know, the music guy gets more time on the platform than I do. Uh, you know, the, the, this, the, my portion of the service isn't long enough. Uh, why did we skip over this this week? And, and there becomes an infighting among staff members, and that's wrong. And we should all have the the idea of we we are the under shepherds of a family. We're like the spiritual parents of a family. And if the children see the parents uh, division divided and and no unity, there's not going to be any unity among the children. The children are going to pick sides and say, you know, hey, I I want to go live with dad. I, I want to go live with mom. That sort of thing. And you know, there there can't be. Uh, um, a spiritual divorce among staff members. And I mean, thankfully we don't have that. I'm very grateful well, for our staff, uh, but that does happen in a lot of others. Sure. I've had people say to me, you know, Oh, I saw that you, you, you let, and I do the air quotes, you let such and such into your pulpit. And I tell them that is not my pulpit, that pulpit, that church, those people were bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and they belong to him. I've been appointed by God, uh, affirmed by the church to be the pastor, but I have no ownership of anything here. I'm, a, I'm here to serve this church. I'm here to lead this church, uh, but it's not my church. And then, of course, they say, I know, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and, and I always respond to that with, that's fine, but I want you to know what I mean. Mm -hmm. You know, this place was here long before me, and if Jesus tarries and, and I, I stay on this earth, It'll be here, or, or, or I don't stay on this earth. I, this church will be here a long time after I'm gone. I'm just going to be a footnote in a, you know, church in a church bulletin one day. Yeah. You know, so somebody one time said, um, uh, "Preach, preach the gospel, die, be forgotten." Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> I can live with that <laughs> and die with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But jealousy is is a big big deal. John didn't have that, thankfully, yeah, he, and he gives us a, a really great insight as the humility of a uh, of a real servant of God yeah that's uh, that pride that can come um, as well and, and pride ties into envy and, and jealousy as well they're kind of a symptom um, but at the root of it is our pride certainly and uh, and that's something that we have to pray um, daily because pride is in the flesh. It sure is. Um, and it's an old, old sin. Right. And, and the flesh is something we're supposed to die to daily um, and pick up the cross. Um, and that's where John is heading with that verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. It's uh, Galatians 2.20, more or less, mm -hmm. and just a couple of words. Yeah. 
Oh, with John the Baptist, he, he realized immediately who Jesus was. And uh, I think that rings true with us today, because when we recognize who Jesus is, then that's going to bring clarity about who we are ourselves. Amen. That's right. That's where we get our identity. Get our identity from that. Um, how many churches, I mean, over the years, we all hear stories, we read articles about churches splitting because of a personality in the church. You know, um, there is... Uh, there's there's a staff member who is who is particularly loved by the church, whether it's you know because they they their customer service attitude is so great, they're there for everybody, um, uh, you know, whatever it is, um, and, and suddenly when that person leaves the church, either by their own choice or by the, the you know the choosing of the church, whatever the reason is. Um, there is a split in the church. And uh, I think that's what John was trying to avoid here. He, he is saying, listen, because John had disciples. He was baptizing people. They were coming to him. They loved him. He was a magnetic uh, personality. He had spiritual attraction, regardless of the, of the, 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 the beard, the hair, the, the garments, locusts. the locusts, you know, um, the, the flamboyancy, if you will. I know that's got that word has a bad connotation now, but it didn't then, I guess. Uh, John was spiritually attractive, and people looked at him and said, "Hey, this is our man. This is the guy." And he's saying, "No, I'm not. There's the man. There's the God, the Lamb." Uh, so stop looking at me and look to him, uh, because he knew that if they didn't take their focus off of him, they were never going to achieve salvation. Mm. And so his love for them. And his humility caused him to take the, the focus off of him and put it where it belonged, on Jesus. And that's what all of us should do. Mm -hmm. well, Absolutely. Because he could be humble and confident uh, because he knew his role uh, all the way through. And, of course, that role is to point people to the Messiah, just like all of ours, every believer's role is to point people to Jesus. Amen. Amen. And, and he, never, he never drifted from uh, his his purpose. He understood what his purpose was. Uh, Richard read uh, Isaiah 40, verse 3. Uh, you know, he, he was a voice in the wilderness crying, you know, pre prepare the way for the Lord. He, he was a herald. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to the, the uh, People's Choice Award, if you will, um, he was trying to avoid uh, a division before the church ever even got uh, started and Paul tells the the, the Corinthians in First Corinthians uh, chapter ten. Um, I'm sorry, First uh, Corinthians chapter one, verses ten through thirteen. He says, uh, "I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment." For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, which is Peter, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized to the name of Paul? Uh, so what, what, he's, what he's saying is that they should be rallying around Jesus right. instead of rallying around a person individual. Right. You know, um, that person's my minister. That person, you know, and it's great that people recognize spiritual gifts in a man. It's great that people, uh, you know, love their pastors. I mean, goodness, we're, we're, we have shepherd's hearts. We, we outflow love and grace and mercy. And it's only natural uh, for individuals who, out in the world, get treated like dogs, they get they get treated like numbers and 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 uh, last names, and then they come into a a place where we all have you know as as Paul says agreement and no division and that we're reunited in the same mind, and and suddenly they're loved by people, um, warts and all, which is how we should love everybody. And so it's, it's only natural that somebody has that spiritual affection for someone. Right. But what Paul says and what John the Baptist says is it's fine 
to love and respect, but don't let that take your focus off of Jesus. And that's that's what the Corinthian church was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what uh, John's followers were doing. He uses some language in these verses too that's um, somewhat called poetic, but John was using an analogy uh, comparing Christ to uh, we're calling the church the bride mm -hmm. um, and Christ is the bridegroom um, and I think that's a really good analogy that John uses there and now Amen. Um, even today you know we still use that language uh, within the church that we are we are the bride of Christ and Christ uh, will one day redeem the church Amen. Um, and take us to be with him and I think that's uh, an awesome thing and I think that's the first time we see that is, uh, is John the Baptist getting into the bride Amen. So, uh, Revelation 19 <clears throat> verse 6 and on then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like roars of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and pure. Mm -hmm. So we, we see this imagery all through the Bible of the church being the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think our Sunday services are a preview of that wedding. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's the rehearsal dinner, <laughs> if you will, uh, for that consummation of the, the bride and the bridegroom. Um, mm. Jesus loves his bride in spite of you know, all of her failures, all of her weaknesses. Uh, he died uh, to, to start the church, to plant the church, to cleanse the church, to, to present the church spotless. Um, and and this, is, this is the one that John was waiting for. He was waiting for the bridegroom. And, uh, and when the, the sun came, the, the star faded. You know, John was a big star. Yeah. But we know in the morning when, when the stars are shining brightly and the sun comes out, the, the sun is visible and the stars start to fade. Mm -hmm. And that's what John that's what John did. He knew it was time for his light to fade and he pointed to the true light, which was Jesus. Amen. Amen. I wonder how many churches are going to be prepared <clears throat> as the bride when Jesus comes back. That is a good question. That is a good question. My prayer is that this church is more than prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's why I spend as much time as I do, and I know that's why you guys spend as much time as you do, trying to teach our church um, the, the, the reality of the gospel. Not just that we are saved uh, through Jesus alone, uh, through grace alone, through our faith alone, um, but also that Jesus is coming back. You know, the, the, this isn't over yet. Um, if you read from, from the beginning to the end, you see that he, he's still alive, he still rules and reigns, and he's coming back for his children. He's going to reestablish you know, a whole new world. And it's going to happen. The next set. Okay. Sure. So we're going to be in John 3, 31 through 36. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. 
Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. I, I love this particular part of the passage uh, because when it comes to life in Christ, I mean, the Bible is so clear, such as passages like this one, that there's two options. There's eternal life or there's eternal judgment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very, very clear. You're either alive in Christ or dead in sin. That's right. That's right. Why do you think that, that message is, is so rejected by mankind? Well, the Bible tells us we're enemies of God. Before our hearts are changed, we are, we're against him. Um, we don't want what he has to offer us. We want what we want. And until that point of salvation, that's just the way humans are. And I think that's where the rejection comes, um, <clears throat> is that we are, our humanity is so against God and replaces God for, you know, it says in, in Romans, you know, we exchange the truth for, for a lie. Right. Um, you know, so we're, people think they already have it figured out. You know, oh, yeah. So it's like that 18 or that 16 year old kid who uh, wants to fight their, with their parents because they know it already, mm -hmm. you know. And, that, and that's who we are before we come to know Christ. And even as, after we know Christ, you know, we are still being sanctified like we talked about before. That's who I was until I turned 17. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, with that, the rejection um, you know, is just something that, you know, that happens, unfortunately. Yeah. We, well, verse, verse 31 talks about the supremacy of Jesus. He who comes from above is above all. Uh, he who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. So John tells us about the supremacy of Christ, that he is above all things. Paul expounds this in his epistles. Um, uh, I think Colossians uh, chapter 1, 15 through I think 20, um, where, where Paul even says, you know, in him, all things exist in him. All things uh, are, are cohesive. They all, he's like the glue of, of the universe. Um, verse 32, he talks about the testimony. So he goes from the supremacy of Christ to the testimony of Christ. Um, he bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Um, and going back to John, uh, uh, John 1, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a simple um, uh, explanation of the gospel. And that's why it's so rejected. One, it's exclusive, because it says Jesus is the only way. Mm -hmm. And we live in a world that says, no, that's not fair. It's not fair that it's either one or the other. There has to be a third option. Right. And so mankind has spent the last 2,000 years inventing religions that offer that third option. The, the problem with that is it's not valid. Because mm -hmm. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one at all, anywhere, ever, comes to the Father except through me. Um, that's unpalatable. Um, so... So we go from the supremacy of Jesus to the testimony of Jesus, and then John talks about the authority of Jesus when he says, whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Um, he has the authority of God because he is God. Mm. So just in those few verses, I mean, he lays out the supremacy, the testimony, and the authority of who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. now, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. The CSB, one of these verses, in the beginning it says, the one who comes from above, which makes it very clear that there is only one oh, yeah. that can do all this. Um, 
And also, I looked up the word um, seal in verse 33, I guess it is. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. And another word for that is certification. So it is certifying that God is true. I mean, it's, it's very simple as that. And um, I think that's what they're trying to say here is that um, God is it, it's certified. I mean, there, there's nothing else beyond him. Mm -hmm. He is the one and he's certified. And um, of course, the certification does, you can look at it as putting a seal to a document. Um, and that's what God does. He seals that document because he seals us in, um, forever and ever. Mm -hmm. Do you see, you see in verse 36 the correlation between belief and obedience? Because John says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But then he rephrases it in a different way. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. And, and so uh, I think that drives home the point of what true faith is. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to say, I believe in Jesus, right? Romans 10, 9. You confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Okay, you've confessed out of your head that Jesus is Lord. But believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. When we believe something in our hearts, it is concrete. It is unshakable. It's, it's something that we know in the fiber of our being, something we truly believe. And when we do that, then we are obedient. Mm -hmm. And so when someone says to me, how do I know that I'm saved? I ask them, are you obedient to the word? Because Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. So there is a, a, a form of uh, measurability to our salvation. Uh, that doesn't mean, hey, I, I'm saved, and I went out and I built a hospital. I gave all my money to build a hospital. So see, I'm saved. Look at me. That's that's not what that's not what we're, we're getting at here. It's so it's daily obedience to the word, living your life in in conformation um, to the commands of Christ. That's right. I think Richard brought that point mm -hmm. a few weeks back. You know, what's the opposite of faith? You know, and it's not doubt, it's disobedience. disobedience. That's right. Later on in this book, it says, it gives an example of what you're talking about, Jim. Think about how ridiculous it would sound if a relative of yours had major surgery and doctors came out to give you an update. You've been worried, so yes. Did she make it out alive? The doctor says, well, sort of. She's sort of dead. That would be absurd. absurd. You can't be sort of dead. <laughs> you're either dead or alive. The same is true for our spiritual lives. We are dead in sin, but we are alive in Christ. The only way to life is through the Son. Mm. That's good. Yeah, I uh, I read a uh, an article about the the found founding of the YMCA, and uh, the story was told by a church planter. And for those of you who uh, are unaware, the YMC started as the Young Men's Christian Association. So it was a Christian organization uh, that was started to minister to young men. Um, and uh, it's been around 100 years, perhaps, maybe longer. I don't know the exact genesis of the organization. Um, but when this church planner wanted to uh, use their building, he went and he talked to the people that, that ran the place. They, they said, I don't think we're allowed to do anything with churches or religious organizations. And his comment was, it's amazing that a group that has the word Christian actually in their name can no longer do business with a Christian or religious organization. Mm -hmm. And he said, they've totally lost their focus. Mm -hmm. And thank heaven that John didn't. John never lost his focus. He knew that his job, was to point people to Jesus Christ. And really, that, that culminates the Christian life. That is our purpose. That is our focus. At least it should be uh, as well. And it's something we should never forget. And it caused him to lose his life here on earth.
shortly after this. Good. That's right. But he gained eternity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you guys have any closing thoughts before we get ready to wrap it up? I re read uh, something from Tony Evans. It said, if two men run to catch a plane and one is one hour late and the other one is one minute late, they both missed the plane. Amen. <laughs> Well, I'll close this in prayer. Father God, we uh, come before you today, Lord, just thankful for your word, which feeds us, it teaches us, it transforms us and conforms us more into the blessed image of your son, Jesus, every day. I thank you, God, for this word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And I thank you for the testimony of John the Baptist Lord, although uh, he had a, a rough and gruff exterior, he had a heart that beats for you. He had a, a mouth that was open, proclaiming the coming of the kingdom of God, telling the gospel to anyone and everyone who would listen to him, always pointing to Jesus right down uh, to the point to where he laid down his life. I pray, God, that you would help us don't just inspire us, God, but challenge us and empower us to live our lives uh, the way that John lived his. Help us, Father, to always point others to Jesus. Uh, give us humility. Uh, give us the, the, the characteristics that we need to live a Christ-exalting, Christ-honoring life. And Lord, may we always be found faithful. And we pray all this in the name that is above every name, the blessed name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.